everyone. So my name is Lily Froelich. I work for Cerebral Therapeutics, and today I'll be providing an update on our product Derigabat and our ongoing phase two trial focusing on the treatment of drug-resistant focal onset seizures. Um, just a brief disclosure um, that I, uh, I'm not a basic scientist or an MD. Um, we've had people previously present on more of the mechanistic aspects of this drug, which I will also do, but I'm gonna be foc focusing actually on the execution of this trial. So a little bit different um, than some of the presentations you've seen today. And these are my actual disclosures and forward-looking statements that I won't make you read because you will go dizzy. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so Derigabat is um, a subtype selective GABA A PAM. Um, and as we heard earlier from Eve here that, uh, benzodiazepines, which are uh, GABA-A PAMs as well, are used to treat a wide range of conditions, uh, but their use and dose are limited due to the AE profiles, even at low doses and low receptor occupancies. Derigabat does have a novel mechanism. It's an alpha-1 sparing, alpha-2, 3, 5 selective GABA-A receptor PAM, and it's formally known as CBL865. Uh, also, as noted earlier, uh, the alpha-1 subunit um, is associated with some of the adverse events that are seen in traditional benzodiazepines, including sedation, cognitive impairment, and addiction. And it's not, those uh, adverse events are not well characterized at the alpha two, three, and five uh, subunits. So therefore it was hypothesized uh, back at the beginning of this program that if you could create an alpha one sparing positive allosteric modulator, this would enable clinical exploration at higher receptor occupancy than classic benzos, uh, a potentially improved AE profile than versus classic benzos, and the potential for broad spectrum and robust anticonvulsant activity, which is seen at the alpha-2 subunit. Um, and that is what, where Derigabat was born. <laughs> so brief note on our uh, preclinical and clinical data to date with Derigabat. Uh, preclinically, we've seen broad spectrum anticonvulsant activity at greater than 50% receptor occupancy in the amygdala kindling, genetic absence epilepsy, PTZ, and MTLE models. Recent data from the MTLE model is shown here, and you can see a nice uh, uh, dose-dependent response. In addition, there was a phase 2A study run with Derigabat that did show potential anticonvulsant activity in the photosensitive epilepsy model. Um, this was a crossover uh, design trial. Each participant was given placebo, a, high do a low dose of Derigabat, a high dose of Derigabat, and lorazepam two milligrams is an active comparator. As you can see, the purple line here is uh, placebo, which has sustained um, photosensitivity. And then the three lines below it are the two doses of derigabat, as well as the active comparator, which showed sustained, reduced, and robust um, lowered photosensitivity. I didn't have time to include a whole slide on our adverse event profile to date. Um, however, uh, the, the hypothesis that uh, by being alpha-1 sparing, we have a differentiated adverse event profile versus class classic benzodiazepines has been shown to date, and we're continuing to collect data in our ongoing phase two trial. So Derigabat data to date has demonstrated this anticonvulsant activity, um, possibly through the high receptor occupancy at the alpha-2 subunit has been generally well tolerated clinically, including at doses uh, that are hypothesized to uh, achieve that high receptor occupancy. So now on to the things I'm a little bit more comfortable presenting on <laughs> our ongoing phase two trial. So this uh, is a double blind phase two placebo controlled trial. Patients are screened and, and enter an eight week baseline period uh, where baseline seizure frequencies are captured at which point after they finish that, if they're deemed to be eligible, they're randomized in a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio to Derigabat 25 milligrams BID, 7.5 milligrams BID, or placebo. They undergo a two-week titration period followed by an eight-week maintenance period, after which point they are eligible, if they are eligible and uh, wish you, they um, roll, can roll over into an open label extension trial. If they do not roll over, they enter a three-week taper period um, and then a safety follow-up period. Key inclusion criteria for this trial include adults with drug-resistant focal onset epilepsy, 
a history of four or more seizures per month for at least three months leading up to screening. And they must be on a background of one to three ASMs at stable doses. The primary endpoint in this trial is a reduction in seizure frequency. So this trial was started uh, back, we started startup back in 2019. Uh, we screened our first patient in January of 2020. Um, as luck would have it, two months later, the world shut down. So <laughs> we had to pause and think about how we were actually going to operationalize and execute this trial, given the complexities of running a clinical trial during COVID-19, especially in the height of COVID-19. So we decided to make modifications to this ongoing phase two trial to uh, account for collecting data remotely uh, via a variety of mitigations. Um, this was to ensure our patient safety first and foremost, that they didn't have to come into the site and get exposed potentially to COVID-19. Uh, in addition, it was of course to ensure the validity and continuity of data collection in the trial as well. We don't wanna have to uh, early terminate or have missing data in the trial. So remote participant visit, visits were, are permitted at certain pre-specified time points in the protocol. Uh, these mitigations include home nursing, uh, direct to patient drug shipment, remote ECG collection, as well as telemedicine options. We also allow uh, an ability in our protocol to over-enroll in the event that we have higher than anticipated early terminations due to COVID-19. And we added a separate COVID-19 informed consent addendum that outlines the risks and mitigations uh, associated with participating in a trial during the COVID-19 pandemic. And that sounds really nice and great. Yeah, you pivoted and, and made your trial more accessible. Uh, there was a huge operational burden to actually put this into action. It's not as simple as it seems. So uh, we first had to take a look at our trial protocol, look at the entire schedule of assessments, understand which assessments could actually be conducted remotely versus which could not. Um, of course, certain scales and things like that, adverse event collection could typically be conducted via traditional telemedicine. However, other uh, assessments such as ECGs, lab draws, et cetera, could not be done uh, via traditional telemedicine. So uh, we had to really understand uh, and tease out how we could actually collect this data remotely. We then evaluated third party vendors who could uh, help with accommodating the collection of this data remotely. Um, again, some of those vendors we ended up selecting included home nursing for, for lab draws. We have a, a handheld tiny ECG device or a six lead ECG device, which is really cool. It's like the size of a credit card, um, which we were able to implement as well, as, as well as some of the other uh, mitigations I mentioned. Um, once we selected all these vendors, we understood against the protocol how we were going to collect all of our data. We made those modifications to the protocol itself, uh, made modifications to our informed consent form, as previously mentioned, and we had to update our trial database because, as some of you may know, the FDA does have a guidance on conducting clinical trials uh, in COVID-19 and the uh, requirement to be able to delineate where your data has been collected. Um, so. It, during the analysis, we can understand if there's uh, different results, differing results based on how the data was collected remotely or on site. And lastly, which is most important, we had to submit all of these updated documents for IRB regulatory authority and ethics committee approval. Um, since this is a multinational trial, each uh, study country has different requirements and regulations. So we had to take a tailored approach per country and really understand the regulations within each country to, to make the right informed decisions. And I'm happy to share that we've now implemented some of these measures in every single study country. Uh, we have utilized these services, over 20 participants have utilized these services to date. Uh, and we've actually been able to keep some uh, participants in the trial that would have otherwise had to early terminate. So it's been a very worthwhile endeavor. Um, and I'm happy to speak more about that. I doubt there's time for questions <laughs> if anyone wants to understand how we did that. And then lastly, uh, just some next steps. So the realized phase two trial is expected to read out uh, mid next year. Uh, we also have our ongoing open label extension, which will continue after the end of the, the phase two double blind trial. And then the data from that trial will inform next steps uh, for the clinical development plan uh, and uh, hopefully moving forward in epilepsy.
In addition, we are uh, targeting to treat anxiety with dirig dirigabat as well. We recently released data from a phase one clinical trial on acute anxiety. So um, we will be uh, moving along in that indication space as well.